Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I've read this now, this scripture about four weeks in a row. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. The reason for that is so none of us can boast about it. But here's what I like our own verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? Why did he do that? So we can do the good things he planned for us long time ago. This has been the central thought that has driven the series. Watch this throughout this, uh, this series. And I'm going to be continuing in that series in, in, in going into some, some ways that we can bring these moments into our lives. So today I'm preaching from the series. Watch this. And I'm preaching the alone syndrome. The alone syndrome. Let's pray right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you will anoint this word, God, that you'll open our hearts, open our minds to hear this word, God, that you'll speak to us, that you'll let us see, God, where where we are in this journey, where we are on on either side of this message, or whether we're in the alone syndrome or we're helping someone through the alone syndrome. God, I ask you that you'll give us clarity on it in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. Now, any time you hear the preaching of the word, at its most basic level, it always falls into two categories, okay? Hear, hear me out. It's either for the season you're in right now, and you, you know it whenever that's happening, the, uh, the minister starts preaching, the pastor starts preaching, somebody starts speaking the word of God, and, and, and you're like, wow, it's speaking right to where I am in this moment. That happens often. The other times is it's for a season you're going to face, Let me tell you, sometimes it will remind you of seasons you've been in, but I can guarantee you every time the word of God is going forth, it's it's setting you up for something you're going to face, and it's going to, it's it's to help you. And I want to make sure you realize every Sunday, every midweek, every opportunity you have to hear the word of God, it is meant to get you through something that, that, that either you're currently dealing with or it's something you're going to deal with in the future, okay? Every time you hear the word of God. And so with that foundation, I want to say a few things, kind of open up this message. No matter what personality you are, none of them, doesn't matter which one you are, loneliness or the feeling of being overwhelmed and alone is a battle we all face at times. You see, unfortunately, life can throw things at you that can create all kinds of havoc. If you like studying personality types, and, and, and I'm, I'm a fan, I, I really do, uh, you, you, will, you will see that there are many different designations and many different breakdowns to personalities. I'm going to share a few. The most basic breakdown that, that, that a lot of businesses use is type A, type B, type C, type D. Four breakdowns. Type A is the goal-oriented person. And as I say what they are, you'll, you'll say, I think that's who I am, the goal-oriented person. Type B is the relationship-oriented person. Type C is the detail-oriented person. I am type C, unashamed. Detail-oriented person. Type D is the task-oriented person. We're going to get those tasks done. We're going to get it done. There are many different versions of personality classification. When when I was growing up, my parents used the, the four temperament theory, and they actually taught lessons here and they and so if you've been in this church for a long time at all you're going to hear you know what these classifications are choleric sanguine melancholy phlegmatic we there's tests for this and and those words are a little bit more uh uh, odd if you've never heard them but if you've if you've done the four temperaments they make total sense if you're wondering what i am i am melancholy choleric which is not a very common combination so if you you think i'm weird it's okay because i am it's not very common to find that one, but melancholy choleric. If you've done, if you've been in, in the business world, you might have heard of the true colors personality test. It breaks, it breaks down to blue, orange, uh, gold, and green. If you're wondering if you've done that, I'm green and gold. That's, that's my, my colors. Currently, this, there's this popular breakdown called the Enneagram test. If you've done that, I'm a strong one. As you can tell, I've done all the personality tests. And this list can go on for a while. The point is, there is what seems like a million versions of ways to break down who we are as people and then cluster them into these personality types. Everybody has a theory. And I like them all. 
whether it's nine different personality types, whether it's five different personality types, whether it's four different types, they all have merit to help explain some of our tendencies. And, and I'm going to tell you, it'll do you well to go learn them. It'll do you well on how you interact with your spouse. It'll do you well, well on how you interact with your kids, on how you interact at work, and how you interact with other people in the body of Christ. It'll do you well. I encourage you to learn about it. But two things I want to point out. Number one, no matter the personality type, each of us are uniquely different. You and I can share the same Enneagram number. You can share the same personality type with your neighbor. You can be melancholy choleric, just like me. But none of that changes the fact that you are unique and I am unique. You are. You're different than your spouse, your kids, your neighbor, your pastor. God only made one of you. He only made one of you. The Bible says in Psalms 139, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. And then it says, thank you, God, for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. I love that line. The Bible says you are complex. Tell your neighbor, I'm sorry I'm so complex. For the married folks here, it's a great verse to memorize to tell your spouse. Hey, babe, I'm sorry I forgot to pick up the milk. I'm sorry I'm so complex. It's just what I am. It'll help you through some things. The point I'm trying to make to you today is you are unique. And the second point I want to point out is that no matter your personality, we all... I'm going to say it again, no matter your personality, you can be as blue as they come, you can be as, as sanguine as they come, you can be as everything's good and awesome as they come, no matter your personality, we all go through storms, trials, and loneliness during seasons of our life. No matter how unique you are, you will face moments of aloneness. No matter what your personality is, you will deal with storms and trials. It's life. There are times in life you will question your purpose. It's natural. There are times in life you will question your giftings. That's normal. There are times in life you will wonder if you're making a difference. That's life. The question today is not if you will face those things. It's what will you do when you face those things. What will you do? You have two choices. We can allow those feelings to overwhelm us. And in turn we lose our effectiveness. Or we can create these disciplines in our life that will allow us to overcome those seasons. Not that you won't go in those seasons, but you'll be able to go through those seasons. And in those seasons, even in, in those trials, you can maintain your effectiveness in your family, in your job, and in the kingdom of God. Over the past few weeks we've been in this series I've, I've titled Watch This. And the premise is simple. I believe God is preparing his church, preparing his people for a move of God like never before. I want to point out, I started this series before the Asbury Revival thing started. I just want to point out, I was already in the vein. God is preparing his church, preparing his people for a move of God like never before. He is calling our attention to himself so that he can do something spectacular in this world. And God placed in my heart that we are in a prelude to revival. And our preparation in these crucial moments will set the stage for how far that revival will go in our hearts, in our minds, in our families, in our, in our church. I, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, I'm all in for the, th the things of God. I'm all in for whatever God wants to do in my life, in my family. We're all in. Whatever it takes, God, we're in. We're in. I'm all in for this church, to, for God to say in this church, watch this, and then show up and show out. I'm ready for him to show up with the miraculous. I'm ready for him to show up and take people out of bondage and change their lives forever. And as pastor here at this incredible church, I don't take it lightly, I am doing everything in my power to bring the word that God has given me to help prepare the hearts and minds of the people for the move of God that is coming. I'm, I'm, I'm just, that's, that's my burden right now. And today my, my premise is simple. The enemy, the devil, the prince of darkness, 
He sees the same things you're seeing. He sees the signs just like you. He knows we're on the cusp of a move of God unlike the world has ever seen. He knows God is preparing the church. He knows we are in a prelude to revival. He knows God is about to say, watch this and show up in a mighty way. So he is now on constant attack against the people to slow the progress of the move of God. I said this last week, but it bears repeating. The enemy cannot stop the grand plan of God, but he can cripple that plan in limited areas. He can take certain areas off the map through an attack. You see, he may not be able to affect total change to what God is going to do, but he can disrupt it in small areas. So he'll attack communities. He'll attack families. He attacks churches. He looks to cripple the body of Christ in as many places as he can. Because though he cannot stop the plan of God, if he can cripple the body, he hurts its effectiveness. And today I'm trying to show you a strategy of the enemy. A tactic the devil will use to limit your effectiveness. A ploy the enemy will use to keep you hurting and in pain. See, first he will try to tell you that you don't matter. He will attack your calling. Attack your worth. He'll attack your joy. And then he goes in for the final blow. The enemy wants you to think you are all alone. You have no support. No one understands your pain. Listen to me today. Those are lies from the enemy. It is how he attacks the people of God to destroy their effectiveness in the kingdom of God. It's how he does it. And they're lies from the enemy. They're lies. I want to show you something in the Bible. Many of us are familiar with the book of Job. And the scriptures say that there was a man named Job who was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Job chapter 1 verse 2 says he had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys. And had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the east. Wow. One day Satan, the great deceiver, challenged the Lord over the faithfulness of Job. And he, he said, does, does Job really fear God? Because you see, you've put a hedge around him, so Job has nothing to fear. But if you would remove the hedge, he's going to curse you to your face. So God said, challenge accepted. And he allowed the devil to attack Job. And I want to read what the scriptures say in Job chapter 1, verse 13 through 22. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. And they put the servants to the sword. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And at this, Job got up and he tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshiped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Now often, when we hear the story of Job, we rightfully focus on the fact that despite all the loss, verse 20 says, he fell on, his gr on the ground in worship. Many of us can quote the prayer in some form. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And I would, I would be remiss not to reinforce those ideas in that moment that no matter the, the struggle, no matter the pain, no matter the loss, there is no better response than to fall on the ground and worship. Though we don't always understand the storm, his ways are still higher. 
Though we don't know why we've had to go through a particular season, his thoughts are still higher. We may not understand it all, but he understands it all. And that's what matters. He is still on the throne. He is in control. And we have to trust him through it all and still worship him no matter what. The greatest response to pressure is always worshiping the king of kings. But today I want to consider something else from these scriptures. I want to review what has happened. Job has just lost a lot. And all of this has happened to Job at least in just a few moments. First, the scripture say, says he lost his oxen, donkeys, and the servants watching them. Then he lost his sheep and the servants watching the sheep. And then he lost his camels and the servants watching his camels. And finally, he lost his sons and daughters. But there were four things in the story that remained. In every case, a servant arrived who said, I alone live to tell you. And what that shows me is that Job hadn't lost everything. Job still had four faithful servants. Four faithful servants who survived the storm, who survived the trial, who survived the pain to get back to Job to tell him their story. But my question for you is what happened to those servants? Why do we never hear of those four faithful servants again? Why were they not tending to Job in his misery? Why were they not helping him when the Lord allowed Satan to attack his health? Why don't we read that as Job was struggling with the boils on his skin, his servants arrived with water from a well to tend to his needs? Why were they not there in his moments of trials and struggles? Why do we not hear their voice of encouragement and see their hand of help? He had four faithful servants left. The Bible doesn't give an answer, it doesn't. but I have a theory, I have a theory, and it's simply this. They were so consumed with the alone syndrome, I alone survived, that they lost focus on their purpose. They fell victim to the alone syndrome. So focused on the fact that they alone survived the hardship, they failed to see they still had a calling. So focused on the fact they alone survived the hardship, they, they failed to see they still had a mission. Each one of the four still had three other faithful servants around them. They still had Job, they still had his wife, they still had a purpose. But they're deleted from the story, in my opinion, simply because of the alone syndrome. I read the other day in psychology today that four disorders thrive on loneliness. Depression thrives on loneliness. Social anxiety thrives on loneliness. Addiction thrives on loneliness. Hoarding thrives on loneliness. Now these disorders can affect anyone, but, but they thrive yeah. on loneliness. Yeah. And the question this article posed that, that, that was so simple yet so impactful, it said, is feeling alone Fueling your struggles. I need you to consider the gravity of that statement. Is feeling alone fueling your struggles? I said it earlier, we all go through trials, struggles, and seasons that we may feel alone. But our response to the feeling of facing something alone has to be intentional. Because if left unmanaged, the alone syndrome is dangerous to us all. Could it be that the alone syndrome is stopping you from achieving your calling? Has it robbed you of your purpose? Could it be that the alone syndrome is the enemy's tool to keep you from doing what God has created you to do? Let me take a moment and speak to this mindset. Do, do me a favor and point to yourself. Hear me today. You are not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. Let me tell you something. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. There is a savior that has conquered every struggle. There is a God who knows you by name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You are not alone. 
You're never alone if you have Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer for your loneliness. He's the answer for the alone syndrome. He's the answer for whatever you're dealing with today. You're never alone if you have Jesus. And I want to take it a step further, you see. If you are connected to the church of the living God, you are not alone. You are not alone. How, how, how do you know? How? Matthew 16, 18 says this. Let me tell you. And I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And listen about how powerful the church is. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell can't prevail. God built the church so that you can have a safe place. You can have a place where hell cannot prevail. The church is meant to be a fortress against the attack of the enemy. The church is meant to be a place where you can find refuge in your storm. A place where you can stand against the powers of darkness. That's the power and the purpose of the church. If you will allow yourself to connect to the church of the living God like it was designed... You will experience the refuge I'm talking about right now. I want to show you how, how, this, how this church played out in, in the early days. And, and right after, very soon after Jesus told Peter that same thing, we find in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 46, he says, we read here how the, the early church was operating and how God used this process he was creating to further his kingdom. And it says, every day... Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They met together. Tell your neighbor together. But they didn't stop just at meeting at the church together. The scripture says they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And because they were together doing what God called them to do, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The growth of the early church was fueled by the church coming together at every opportunity. The design of the church is built around people meeting together, working together, breaking bread together. You're not meant to do it alone. Tag groups right here should be written in my notes, but it's not. But let me tell you, that is why we have groups in this church, because you're not meant to do it alone. You're meant to be with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. You're meant to find opportunities. I'm telling you, join a group and connect with that group and watch what God will do in your life. Watch how the alone syndrome suddenly disappears because you're connected biblically to the church of God. See, when you're connected to the church biblically, you're not alone. And I, I believe here today that God is trying to show his people something through the word. If we're going to have watch this moments in our personal life, it happens when we fight off the alone syndrome and come together in unity with the body of Christ. If we're going to have watch this moments in our family where God does something miraculous, it happens when we're in unity. If we're going to have watch this moments in our church, it happens in unity as we come together. Together. Don't let the enemy attack you with the alone syndrome. Don't give him a foothold in your life. Take every opportunity, every opportunity to come together with the body of Christ in unity. And then watch what God is going to do in your life. I'm, I'm telling you, you can say it's prophetic. Watch what God will do in your life if you'll come together as the body of Christ. Now, I'm not naive. Mm -mm. I remember COVID gave me plus 10 years. So I've been pastor, lead pastor for at least 13. So I'm not naive. I am well aware that often there are people hearing the word preached or taught, but because of your personal battle, what you're dealing with right now, in your mind, with a smile on your face, you're arguing the points I'm making. Well, pastor, you say we're not alone if we're connected to the church, but I'm here right now. I attend church every week. Why do I still feel alone, Mr. Preach Man? 
That's what you're saying in your mind. I know. It's like it's popping up in front of you right now. Glad you asked so nicely, though, so I'm going to give you an answer. There is a difference between freedom in actions and freedom in your mind. See, we happen to live in a free country. You can attend church without a fight. You can go to church functions without anyone trying to stop you. You can attend groups without having to sneak through police barricades to get there, depending on where your group is. I don't know. You have freedom in your actions, but freedom in your mind is something totally different. The battle of the mind, that's a continuous battle. The enemy is at war with your mind every day. He wants to hold you captive. He wants to hurt your potential. He wants to cause you to give up and give in. He wants to bind you with chains. So every day, you have to wake up with the intention to be free in your mind. You may be free in your actions, but you're not free in your mind unless you attack it every single day. You have to be prepared to fight for it every single day. Our mind is a powerful thing. You can listen how powerful it is. You can be surrounded by people and still feel alone in your mind. And in like manner, you can be all alone in a room, all alone on a mountain, all alone walking through the forest, not a soul around you, and have not one thought of loneliness. The alone syndrome is not physical, but it's mental and it's spiritual. That's what the alone syndrome is. See, I'm reminded of Elisha. I'm, 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 I'm hurrying. I'm, I'm reminded of Elisha in 1 Kings. If you were to go and read chapter 18 in its entirety, you would read of great moments in Elisha's ministry. Elisha called fire down from heaven, folks. Powerful moments. Elisha prays for rain, and his prayer breaks the drought in the land. But if you were to continue reading 1 Kings, you would find Elijah in the beginning of chapter 19 sounds like a totally different Elijah. We start checking if it's a J or an SH. We start trying to wonder, is this the same guy? Is this the same guy? 1 Kings 19 verse 1 says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. He left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. You see, the alone syndrome fuels depression. The alone syndrome fuels negativity. Elijah, a great prophet, in spite of all his victories, still entered a season where he faced the alone syndrome. The scriptures say Elijah journeyed alone to the mountain of God. And it took him 40 days and 40 nights journeying alone to get to the mountain. And there on that mountain, if you read the whole chapter, God shows up on that mountain. And here's what he asked me. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Go read it for yourself, NLT version. It actually says, what are you doing here? First Kings 19 and 10, Elijah replies, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets, and I alone have survived. And now they're trying to kill me too. I'm the only one left, struggling with the alone syndrome. Verse 15 says, Then the Lord told him, this was his answer. Whatever you're saying, this is his answer. Go back the same way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Haziel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat from the town of Abel Meholah to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who've never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. I'm going to break it down for you. Listen closely, Elijah. 
I know you felt all alone, but in reality, you were never alone. There were 7,000 others who've never bowed to false gods. You did that. You thought that. Elijah, I know you have done great things, but no one is immune to the alone syndrome. Elijah, I know you're struggling with this syndrome, this alone, this loneliness, but God never told you to leave your servant and go into the wilderness all by yourself. He didn't tell you to do that. You did that on your own. Driven by fear. You see, fear will make you do some crazy stuff. Speaking to someone right now, God didn't tell you to pull away from everyone you know. God didn't tell you to alienate yourself from those closest to you. You did that on your own. And God's saying, why are you here? You've allowed fear to drive you into isolation. You've allowed disillusions to drive you in, into isolation. And, and, and God is saying, why are you in this place of loneliness? You did this to yourself. I'm preaching to someone today, this is for you. You have paused the work of God in your life, struggling with the alone syndrome. But God wants to tell you, today all of that can change. You're not meant to be alone. God is reaching for you, just like he reached for Elijah on that mountain in 1 Kings chapter 19. You are not meant to be alone, and it can change today in Jesus' name. Today, I hope that I have been getting across this point to you. There will be moments that you have to face the alone syndrome, but you don't have to succumb to it. You don't have to spend the 40 days and 40 nights that Elijah spent in that season. You can learn from the word of God. That's why it's written. And you can overcome it before it takes root in your life. But let me tell you, the beauty of 1 Kings 19 is that within that chapter, God gave the key to overcoming the alone syndrome. Listen, you got you to read it. You got to see it. I want you to grasp what the Lord told Elijah in verse 15. After all of this has happened, he continues, Elijah, you are not alone. There are 7,000 others. But to overcome this alone syndrome in your mind, here's what he told him to do. I want you to go back the same way you came. You got here on your own. You're going to get back on your own. But when you arrive back to the place you should have never left, I want you to do what I created you for. Anoint a new king of Aram. I created you for that. And after that, anoint a new king of Israel. And after you do that, anoint a new prophet to be your future replacement. You see, Elijah, to overcome the alone syndrome, it can only happen when you go back to what I called you to do. Elijah... You are unique. I formed you in your mother's womb. I made you wonderfully complex. And I created you for a purpose. You were given gifts and talents, Elijah, that are specific to you. So go back where you started and re-engage in your purpose. I hope you see the beauty of 1 Kings chapter 19 today. The beginning of 1 Kings chapter 19 shows Elijah leaving his servant and entering into a season of battle with the alone syndrome. But the same chapter ends with Elijah returning to his purpose, anointing Elisha, and Elisha follows him and becomes his assistant for the rest of Elijah's time on earth. He never has to face the battle alone again. And today I've come to remind this church you are never alone. God has a purpose for you. God has a calling for you. God is with you. And the system he created for you to serve the kingdom is by being the church of the living God. So connect with the church. Get into your purpose. You will always win the battle of the alone syndrome if you never stop operating in your calling and you stay connected to the body of Christ. Learn from the scriptures today. Don't stop serving the king of kings. Don't stop making a difference in the kingdom of God. Because as long as you stay connected to your purpose and connected to the church, you are never alone. Like Job's servants and like Elijah, you can either fall into this mindset that you alone survived and no one else can know what you're going through. Or you can make up your mind. Nothing is going to stand in my way for fulfilling what God has called me to do. I am not alone. Can we stand in this place right now? 
There's something interesting, interested, interesting in fine, in, 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 that I find in 2 Kings chapter 2 with regard to Elijah. On three different occasions, Elijah attempts to leave Elisha and continue his journey alone. Three different occasions. He's already done it once, but he tries it again. On one example is verse 2. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. Same thing happens in verse 4. Same thing happens in verse 6. And each time Elisha had the same response. Listen to what happens in verse 9 though. When they got to the other side, after Elisha refused to leave him, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you when I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit and become your successor. He says, you have asked a difficult thing, Elisha replied. If you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. And if we follow the scripture, Elisha was there when Elijah was taken. And Elisha received a double portion of the anointing that was on Elijah. Why? Because he decided he would never leave the side of Elijah. Sometimes you're the one battling the alone syndrome. And in those times, it's imperative you reconnect to your mission and reconnect with the body of Christ. But other times, you are Elisha. And you're called to stick closer, close to your brother and sister in the Lord, no matter what they say. And your greatest blessing may just come because you didn't allow someone else to go into the wilderness alone. Perhaps your double portion will come because you said, no, I won't leave your side, even though you're asking me to, because I know my calling. My calling was to be your right hand. Before I pray for you today, I want to leave you with one final scripture to show you that there is strength in numbers. Can't do any of this, this whole message without this. Ecclesiastes 4 and 12 says, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. No matter your season of life, I'm telling you, no matter what the enemy throws your way, I'm telling you, no matter the circumstances that may be unique to you, I'm telling you, Always remember, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but when two of us get back to back, nope, not going to win. When three of us come together, that's even better. When the church comes together, it's a prelude for revival. Something's about to happen in this place. Something's about to happen in your heart because we've come together and the enemy cannot win when we're together. Together we win together we win. Right now, I don't know what you're dealing with, what you're going, going through, but these altars are open. I believe God wants to do some work in this place right now. God wants to bind some people together forever and say, hey, together we're back to back. The enemy can't win this one. God wants to tell somebody in this place, go back to your calling. Your calling is going to bring you through this season. I'm telling you in this place, God is here. He wants to work in your life. He wants to do a miracle for you right now if you'll let him. No matter what you're dealing with I, I encourage you come to the front no matter what you're struggling with I encourage you to come to the front no matter who's on your mind I encourage you come to the front in for them and watch what God is gonna do God's about to do something great in this place in Jesus name in Jesus name place I feel God wants to do a work in this place wherever you are if you have a need if you feel God is speaking to you maybe this isn't even for this season but it's for a season you're going to go through and you know God is preparing you and giving you a word I, I want to pray for you that this will stick in your spirit 
that this will stick no matter what the enemy throws your way. I want to pray that you will always remember that there is strength in being connected with the body. There is strength in understanding that, that Jesus is the answer, that he is, he, with him you are never alone. So I want to pray for you. If you lift your hands up right now, I believe God wants to do something in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every situation, you see every struggle, you see the past, you see the present, and you see the future, God. You know what they're going to walk through. You know what they've already walked through. So in this moment, I pray in Jesus' name that you step into every situation, that you bring peace to every storm, that you bring a encouragement to every struggle, God, that you bring strength to every battle. In the name of Jesus, right now, God, do what only you can do in this place. Do what only you can do in their hearts. In Jesus' name, let the Holy Ghost flow in this house. Let the Holy Ghost feel someone in this house. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, do what only you can do right now. In Jesus' name. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.